it rained today. Me too. My hair didn't like it, evidently. <laughs> All right, well, welcome everyone to the Saddlebrook Science Cafe. It's fun to be on the other side of the stage. <laughs> and I'm so happy to see so many familiar faces. To begin, most of you know me, but I'm Samantha Pierce. I'm one of the program coordinators for the College of Science. And tonight, I get to facilitate the talk. So bear with me if I mess up a lot. It's my first day. <laughs> All right. Now, as you all know, we're going to continue our journey from Earth's core to the clouds. And if you're new to the series, welcome. And if you're returning, thank you. Now, for those interested, the Desert View Performing Arts Center does stream and upload their talks to their YouTube page. And all of their talks that are uploaded on the YouTube page, I also upload to our College of Science website. So if you have the brochure on there, it's going to have the collegeofscience.arizona.edu. All of the videos from this series are going to be up as well, including all of the other venues. And you can also explore the different venues that we have that present science cafes, and then the videos that they've recorded as well. All right. Now, our new science cafe brochure is up at the front. If you haven't grabbed it already, we did have one date change for a different venue. So it's an updated version, just an FYI. And we do encourage you to check out the other Science Cafe venues. We have Tumamock Hill, Borderlands Brewing, and Downtown Science Cafe at Magpie's Pizza. Each venue is mentioned in the brochures. And then if you head over to the College of Science website, it gives more information on the presenters and the talk descriptions. All right. Now, how many of you have been to the College of Science lecture series this series? Yay. Good. Good. All right. Well, this upcoming Monday is going to be the fifth out of the six lectures. And if you haven't been able to attend yet, all of the past lectures are up on our website, and it's uascience.org. That's also listed on the brochure in the back. Um, we do partner with Arizona Public Media. So if you're not able to see the podcast for any reason or you're not able to make it down to the U of A, they do live stream it. So once the link is available, you just click on it, and then it takes you right to the live stream of it. So you can watch it Monday night from your home, and you don't have to make it all the way to the U of A. <laughs> And if you haven't heard, this series is about artificial intelligence, AI. Really cool. I know last week the presenter got a standing ovation. So it was a really good presentation. Definitely check it out if you haven't. The podcast is up. And then set your calendars for Monday to check out the one online as well. All right. Next month, March 10th and 11th, the Tucson Festival of Books will be on the U of A Mall. And as part of the Tucson Festival of Books, Science City will be there. You've heard us mention this 100 times before, but we are going to have over 80 booths throughout the six different neighborhoods, all dedicated to science literacy. There will be a science cafe tent, which will be similar to this, going on both days, all day, so at different times and whatnot. And, and they're going to be speaking to the different disciplines. So we're going to have medicine, tech, um, astronomy, all that great stuff going on. And we also have a Science City Passport. So this is something new that we're doing this year to commemorate the 10th year anniversary for the Tucson Festival of Books. In addition to the Science Cafe, there will also be a science stage where all the authors and panels will present as well. And if that isn't enough to keep you busy, all the tours and all the open houses are going to be free all day, both days. So for anyone who hasn't seen the Mirror Lab, Tree Ring Lab, Flandro, all of that's free those two days. Cool. All right, and simply as a reminder to our format, in a moment I'm going to introduce our awesome speaker. He's going to give his presentation. Following the presentation, we do have a cool video for you guys. And then from there, we'll do question and answer with the roaming mics. As always, take the microphone, ask your question, give it back. We want to make sure everybody has a moment to ask. And. Dr. Andy Cohen graciously decided that he would be able to stay a few minutes afterwards to speak about all of these cool things up front as well. So if you haven't had a chance before the lecture, definitely take a look at these. All right, and as you all know, we have amazing research facilities at the College of Science, especially in the geosciences department. The U of A is always ranked within the top 10 at, for geosciences. So if you're interested in more information, definitely pick up one of their brochures in the front. And last tidbit before we get to the cool stuff, <laughs> we do have evaluations out front. Now, this feedback really helps us better facilitate, bring topics here that you would better like to hear and what really speaks to your interests, as well as provide feedback to the presenters. And at the bottom of the evaluation is the email portion. If you don't get our emails and you want to, definitely fill it out. I'm the one who handles all of the announcements, so 
I send you all of those great emails. <laughs> Not pesky by any means, like once a month. And nowhere in their emails do we ask for money or donations. All of those announcements in the science cafes in general are all free and for the community. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce tonight's presentation, Humans and Humidity, How Past Climate May Have Shaped Our Evolutionary History. And presenting is Dr. Andrew Cohen. Dr. Cohen is currently a professor for the Geosciences and Ecology and Evolutionary Biology departments. He received his BA from Middlebury College in 1976 and his PhD from the University of California, Davis in 1982. Dr. Cohen has been with the U of A since 1986 and he does research on lakes and lake deposits to understand the records of climate and environmental change. And you'll learn more about what he does within his lab during his presentation. Some fun facts about Dr. Cohen. He's an avid African art collector. He likes to scuba and, he, excuse me, he likes to scuba dive and he's a certified dive master. His great uncle was Albert Einstein's lawyer. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> And one of his super cool hobbies, and I'm sure you all will like this, he makes, it, he makes his own beer. He's a beer maker. <laughs> Tonight, Dr. Cohen will discuss a few findings from his research on ancient African lake beds that is shedding light on the environment and climate under which our ancestors evolved over the last few million years. For the past 10 years, Dr. Cohen has been the director of the Hominin Sites and Paleo Lakes Drilling Project a major international research team involving over 120 scientists and students from over 11 different countries. The mission is to try to understand the role past climate may have had in influencing our evolution. Let's give it up for Dr. Andy Cohen. Am I, my mic on? Yep. Okay. I'm just going to give Sam a second to get back to the booth so she can advance my slides because I don't have a controller up here. So as she said, uh, my field, my specialty within geosciences is, is called paleolimnology. We look at uh, lake deposits to give us clues about past environmental conditions, including past climate. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that tonight. Uh, so um, the story I'm going to tell you is based on, uh, as Sam alluded to, uh, uh, research by a large team of scientists. It's not just from my lab. It's by many people. Uh, but it all uh, hinges on the idea, in a nutshell, that uh, evolution, especially evolution of, our, of humans and our close relatives, the hominins, uh, may have been influenced by environmental and specifically by climate change in the past. And so uh, we've been investigating this uh, through the collection of geological evidence. And I'm going to be telling you about some of that uh, tonight. So if we can, Sam, back there, if we can have the first slide. The story of um, human evolution until uh, the more recent portions of it is largely a story that uh, takes place in Africa. And the evidence that I'm going to talk about uh, is all from Africa. Spanning uh, the last six million years, the time frame from uh, when our lineage, the hominins, split apart from the lineage that became the, uh, the, the African great apes. So, uh, and, and this story involves, uh, yeah, if you can go ahead and, and advance that. This story involves uh, uh, evidence from fossils uh, from many parts of Africa, but one of the major areas, and the area where I've done most of my research, is in the eastern part of the continent, in the eastern uh, Rift Valley. And the reason that we, uh, you, if you've seen nature uh, documentaries about the leakies or others, uh, the reason that so many of us go there year after year, um, summer after summer, spending a lot of time in the field, is because there are many fossils preserved there, because the rift is a place where the continent is of Africa is being pulled apart, and material has accumulated in that Rift Valley over millions of years. So um, the record uh, that we have of uh, our fossil ancestors and near relatives is largely coming from deposits in that region. And I'll spend a little bit of time talking about some of those fossils. I have casts here. Uh, they're not the real thing for the skulls. But I do have some uh, real artifacts, stone tools up here, and a, and a core. And, and I encourage you to come up at the end of the talk 
take a look at these and I'm happy to answer questions. I'm not an anthropologist, but I work with them enough that I feel somewhat confident talking about them. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, let's go to the next slide. So uh, as I said, the, the story of human evolution until about two million years ago is, is an exclusively an African story. And it starts about six million years ago over on this time chart uh, going from older, older to uh, younger uh, uh, from about six million years ago when our lineage split apart from, uh, from chimps. So uh, you can see that there are many, many different species of hominins. And we're the last man and woman standing. There's only one species of us today, but all of these uh, skulls and these little range bars with the uh, time scale at the top, I hope you can see that, going back to seven million years, represents the ranges of these different species over time. So it's mostly an African story. Next slide. But uh, some people might disagree with that. Um, I don't know what we'd call ourselves today. Uh, homo nudnicus or something, I, I don't know. Anyway, um, next slide. So evolutionary biologists uh, like to organize our understanding all the way back to Darwin in these uh, tree-like diagrams, phylogenetic trees. Not, sorry, I wasn't, go back. Um, uh, a tree that, that illustrates the branching of different lineages as we've evolved over time. And uh, all right, we can, we can live with that. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have the controls. Um, so one of the questions that uh, we often ask in trying to understand how these lineages split apart, what might have caused one species to evolve, another one to go extinct, is the relationship between um, our environment and the way that we adapt to those conditions. So evolution, as I'm sure you're aware, is driven by uh, changes in the environment. And, and uh, just like these polar bears uh, have over the past half million years or so, uh, since they split apart, that lineage split apart from brown bears and grizzlies, uh, they've adapted to their polar environment by uh, evolving a lighter color, uh, which gives them an adaptive advantage living on, on ice flows and, and fishing uh, a better abilities to swim, and a, a whole host of adaptations that go along with their environment. Similarly, people have asked questions about what may have caused morphological or shape changes and uh, uh, the uh, changes in our technology, all the things that make us and our close relatives humans or near humans, and what has been the role of climate and environmental change in driving natural selection in our own lineage, the hominids. So uh, next slide. Okay, so to answer that, we have to look at the question of what the environments were actually like that these early hominins experienced. This uh, uh, image on the left-hand side is actually a, a drawing that uh, an artist, Jay Maternus, put together based on trackways, fossil trackways, that were discovered uh, about 40 years ago uh, by Mary Leakey and Andrew Hill uh, in the shadow of a, a big volcano in northern Tanzania. And those tracks actually provided us with firsthand evidence for the fact that this particular species, Australopithecus afarensis, was an upright, bipedal, like, we, like us, uh, organism that uh, not only did it um, walk, but it one day, a couple of these animals uh, walked through a cloud of volcanic dust, which was uh, settling to the ground solidifying and leaving behind uh, uh, a fossil record of their passing and, by the way, telling us that these organisms actually walked on two legs. So uh, we want to understand something about the environment that uh, early humans lived in, or early hominins, and to do that we have to have ways to reconstruct that history. Next slide. We've been, um, we've been looking at this question for a long time. People have started to speculate about this almost 100 years ago with the discovery by this uh, gentleman, Raymond Dart, of this fossil, Australopithecus um, africanus, in South Africa. 
in the 1920s. And uh, if you read this uh, quote from his paper, for the production of man, a different apprenticeship was needed to sharpen the wits and quicken the higher manifestation, I love this writing, of intellect, a more open veldt country where competition was keener between swiftness and stealth. Southern Africa, by providing a vast open country with occasional wooded belts and a relative scarcity of water, furnished a laboratory such as was essential to this penultimate phase of human evolution. Boiling it down, he, what he was saying was that he felt that there was an environmental control that was uh, a, a major factor in the adaptation of this early species of hominin. And uh, although we might not agree with all of the details of his views, what came to be called the savanna hypothesis, that we are completely creatures of the savanna. Many aspects of that are probably, uh, in, a, in a broad sense, uh, still things that we think are, are broadly accurate. Uh, next slide. OK, so uh, over the past 100 years, there's hardly a transition in human evolution that hasn't been attributed in some way or form to uh, to the, with a possible linkage to uh, environmental change. The origin of bipedalism, our ability to walk on two legs. Uh, the origin of the big jawed hominins that uh, you can take a look at up here. Uh, our own uh, genus, the group that we belong to, Homo. Uh, the origin of stone tool as, and of their various types. Uh, the modern body form about two million years ago. The spread of our own genus Homo out of Africa initially about two million years ago, and the first human occupations by archaic Homo and things like Neanderthals in, uh, in Europe. A second dispersal of our own species, the evolution of our own species, Homo sapiens, maybe about 300,000 years ago, and they're, and they're spread into Europe and Asia and eventually all over the world, uh, starting perhaps 200,000 years ago. And then, really critically, the extinction of all of these species may also be, so it's not just the evolutionary events of new lineages evolving, but also the disappearance of all those other species, and we're the last ones standing. So I think one of the things I hope that you'll take away, it's under the surface here, but it's, it's certainly in our research thinking, is what the implications of all of this has uh, for, our, for our own humanity in our own future. Next slide. There we go. OK. So um, in order to understand the relationship between uh, environmental change and human origins, we or, or origins of different species of, of hominins, we have to have two uh, very different types of evidence. We have to have the paleoanthropological evidence in the form of the, of the bones, the skulls, the, the legs that show upright walking, the shape of the skull and size of the skull that tells us something about the capacities of that, of that animal, and then also the tools that they made. And uh, so that's the purview of paleoanthropologists. Uh, what I'm going to be mostly talking about tonight is the other side of the equation, which is the climate record, the environmental record, and how we go about getting that. But in order to understand this, we have to frame our ideas about uh, 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 evolutionary change into a, a hypothesis. So scientists love to make hypotheses. And um, uh, for, for the past 100 years, as people have thought about this relationship, what might be the drivers of uh, from the environment that may be uh, causing uh, uh, species of hominids to adapt to those conditions. So um, th these can be boiled down into three broad flavors. Uh, one, that uh, adaptation and new species evolve during times of very stable habitat. And the, the wiggly line here is for any environmental variable, but let's say just precipitation, because that's an important one, whether it's wet or dry uh, in East Africa, for example, that uh, new species might be spawned off during times when uh, conditions are stable. They might uh, appear during periods of time when there's a progressive change, so the environment is getting drier, or wetter, or colder, or warmer. Or they might be uh, adapting to more variable uh, environmental conditions. 
And this is where my field of geosciences and particularly paleolimnology comes in because we can provide the records that can be paired up with the first appearances or the last appearances of these different species. Next slide. There we go. Okay, so uh, early on, uh, for probably the first 60 or 70 years of people seriously uh, thinking about how could we go about collecting this kind of evidence, uh, most of it was based on simply looking at where the uh, the, the bones were coming from. This middle picture right here is uh, actually an elephant butchery uh, about a million and a half years old. But if you look on the left, this was, a, this was an excavation that I was fortunate enough to be a part of when I was a graduate student, uh, a very famous paleoanthropologist from Berkeley on the left there. And you can see uh, right through the middle there, they're filled in with black uh, sand, so they show up a little bit better as, in, as a series of these early human footprints. Uh, you can also see a bird print right to the, uh, to the left of the guy at the bottom of the picture, a little three-toed large heron. Uh, so what this was was a lake shore where uh, a, uh, an early Homo erectus, uh, that's, a, that's a size eight foot, um, so uh, somebody that was, you know, modern stature actually, and taking a stride about the length of ours, but as he as he, and we think it was a he, uh, went off a little bit further into the water. He was going into a lake and it gets squishier and the prints get deeper and deeper. Uh, so we can capture a moment in time here and say quite a bit about the environmental conditions. So these kinds of outcrop places where we find the fossils, whether they're footprints or actual bones or, or stones, they, uh, they provide us with first-hand evidence of what the environmental conditions were like. Uh, and for many years, this kind of outcrop studies uh, were the uh, bread and butter of trying to put an environmental context on human origins. Look at the place directly where the fossils are coming from. The limitation of that is that the nature and the kinds of records we can get from, uh, from where the, the humans were living, we're terrestrial organisms, and even though we might walk into the edge of a lake, uh, we don't walk very far into it. Um, the, uh, the, the places where bones are found, ancient riverbeds, ancient soils, are not really very conducive to providing us with the most detailed kinds of records. Uh, of, of past climate change or past environmental change. So about 30 years ago, people started taking a different approach. They started collecting sediment cores from the deep sea. And this is a, a drill ship. You can see the big drilling derrick on the, uh, surf, on the top of that, the Joides Resolution, which goes around the world collecting sediment cores from the bottom of the oceans. And from those cores, we learned a great deal of importance uh, of um, information about the uh, climate and environments around Africa. Next slide. Uh, one of the things, I promise not too many graphs, uh, uh, one of the things that we learned is uh, changes in environmental conditions over the past, uh, the time span, the, the last six million years or so, uh, that uh, climate has uh, deteriorated or changed significantly towards a uh, both a colder and a more variable world. So you can see going from the period that geologists call the Pliocene from about uh, six million years ago until about two and a half million years ago. All those wiggles are kind of small and then you can see they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger uh, and they're all sort of trending towards colder conditions as well. Uh, this is the descent of the world into the ice ages that uh, we've experienced over the past couple of million years. So um, global climate has gotten colder and more variable uh, as you uh, transition through this period of time. Uh, and we know this from some of these deep sea cores. Uh, next slide. We also uh, know that over the time period uh, that uh, a lot of the really interesting things are happening in, in human evolution, this, this branching pattern that you can see here on the left from this uh, ancestral group, the Australopithecines, to these big jawed, big headed, big skulled guys, the our anthropus and our own lineage, Homo, uh, that that was going on in the context not only of the world getting colder as a whole, uh, but also East Africa 
was becoming drier. And these curves on the, on the right-hand side, uh, there's no quiz, uh, but uh, uh, just to explain to you a little bit, we use evidence from these deep sea cores and also from ancient soils to uh, tell us in both cases those curves veering off towards the right are indicative of more open vegetation, in other words, a drier climate. So the deep sea cores really uh, gave us a lot of information uh, about the broad environmental conditions around Africa. Next slide. But there was a problem with both those outcrop records and the deep sea records. The deep sea records are far from the action of where the people were actually living. Uh, in most cases, they might be a thousand miles or more uh, away, even for the relatively close ones. And the problem with the, uh, the outcrops where the fossils were being found, like this, this is actually in Kenya, very close to uh, where the uh, Turkana boy skull, one of the ones, Homo erectus, that I have here, uh, was discovered. This is what they look like. And to a geologist, this looks like junk. Um, these, these are very highly weathered ancient soils. Uh, and lake beds, very hard to interpret uh, because on, as they're exposed to the elements, uh, those muds uh, just fall apart. They, they become very, it's very difficult to interpret the records out of them. So we have a problem of distance and also of weathering of those rocks that make just studying the outcrops or just studying these distant cores uh, difficult. Uh, next slide. So about uh, 20 years ago, actually more, when, when I was a grad student, I went to a couple of meetings where people started uh, drooling and dreaming about the idea of doing this. And we finally pulled it off uh, in 2005 to recreate a drill ship in the middle of one of the lakes in the center of the African Rift Valley. So that's the image you're seeing there on the left. Uh, the only thing that was there at the beginning was that barge at the bottom. We had to bring all of that equipment in mount it on that barge, uh, punch a hole through the ship, and hope it didn't sink. No, we hire uh, marine architects to tell us that it, that's not going to happen. And then here's a really cool thing. You see those uh, at the four corners of the barge, there are those blue shafts going down into the water. Those are engines that are talking to a satellite. Uh, it keeps, because this water here is 600 meters deep, 2,000 feet, too deep to anchor the barge. So we have to stay stationary while we're drilling a hole down through the lake beds. And uh, after we finish this project, um, those uh, engines and all the computer equipment that went along with them just sat on a shelf, not on a shelf, they sat in a warehouse for, for many years. Those are really big engines. And uh, nobody else in our field had a use for them until about uh, three years ago, we found a buyer for them uh, named Elon Musk. And uh, he used them on the SpaceX Falcon lander, and they were working great until a couple of days ago. I don't know if you saw when the heavy one landed and it, it missed the landing pad out in the ocean, and, and it blew up two of those. So we were kind of sad about that. But we were glad to see them re being repurposed for something else. Anyway, uh, that was a very exciting to be involved in that. Uh, but um, uh, collecting records out in the middle of the lake is expensive and time consuming. And uh, so we thought, well, maybe we can get records that are more directly related to this question about human origins by drilling some uh, outcrop sites in ancient lake beds. And I'm going to show you why we're so fixated on lakes in a second. Uh, but here on the right, you're seeing one of our drilling sites in northern Kenya, very close to where the Turkana boy fossil was found, Lake Turkana in the background, uh, going through the same kind of lake beds that are down below that barge, 600 meters, but where we can bring up that rig on a truck rather than building uh, an elaborate uh, and very expensive uh, drilling uh, platform out in, uh, out in a modern lake. Uh, next slide. So um, we, we collect uh, these cores uh, to answer some questions. And on the right, on the left here, you're seeing uh, one of these cores split in half. I have an example of a, of a sediment core up here uh, taken by uh, a much less sophisticated, basically a tube over the side of a boat with a wire. Uh, this is, in, in all cases, we're doing the same thing. We're taking a, um, some kind of a device, pushing it down into the sediment, 
with a drilling system, we can keep doing that, pu pushing them down further and further and further. And we bring them up to get these um, uh, sediments, which on the, in the left-hand image here, you're seeing one of these cylindrical tubes that's been sliced down the middle, so uh, mirror images there, to answer questions like how wet was the environment, how warm was it, what's the vegetation like, all of those are key questions that we have to answer to, to address the question of what the conditions were that these early hominins faced in East Africa. And uh, here you can see a couple of my students working in the lab, uh, cutting up the samples, taking uh, uh, subsamples out of those cores uh, that'll be analyzed for various uh, environmental, environmentally sensitive variables. Next slide. OK, so why lake sediments? Here's a picture of some lake beds. Uh, these are uh, relatively modern ones, but you can see down on the bottom a scale in centimeters. So these are, uh, you know, these individual layers that you're seeing here, black, white, black, white, over and over again, are down on the scale of millimeters. And each one of these is laid down in a year or less. Uh, in fact, they probably represent annual cycles of change in that lake uh, as a response to climate conditions the surface, affecting how things are growing in the lake. And so uh, the lake sediments are super sensitive. We can read them like a history book. Next slide, or advance that, if you would. Lots of useful clues to the past about climate, which we can't get directly from the outcrops where the hump fossils are. And we can pull out of them things like different types of fossil algae or pollen, which I'll say more about later on, from trees and grasses, telling us what the vegetation was like. And really exciting, uh, it, you may have been to a presentation in the same Science Cafe series uh, by my colleague Jess Tierney uh, a month or two ago. Uh, she's a specialist looking at organic compounds that we can uh, pull out of these cores and tell a great deal, again, about vegetation and actually reconstruct things like temperature what was the actual temperature, plus or minus less than a degree. Uh, so that's, that for uh, somebody who's trying to reconstruct the past is really exciting. Next slide. OK, so going back to our outcrop picture, the drill cores let us see the details. Here's, again, that crummy, crumbly outcrop. And then uh, if we look at this same sequence, you can see vaguely the layers in there. Uh, about this thick, each of that, that little outcrop is maybe 10 feet high for scale. But then if we look at the same sequence of rocks with the cores, this is what we see. We see a great deal of detail. We can go in there and uh, those white speckly units you see on both of those uh, uh, core horizons, so you're see just seeing a small segment here. This is each of those, again, is a centimeter, each of the numbered intervals. Uh, that, that speckly horizon is a soil, an ancient soil that formed when the, uh, the, the bottom of that lake was dry. And then immediately above it, you can see those layers. Uh, that represents the period when the lake came back in, flooded that area when climate got a little bit wetter. So we can read this like a book, and we can sample in great detail uh, the individual environmental and climate events that happened in the past. Next slide. OK, so um, all of that is kind of preamble to our project, uh, which is called the Hominin Sites and Paleo Lakes Drilling Project. As Sam mentioned, it's a very international group. We have uh, currently about 140 scientists and uh, professionals and students involved in the project. And this is at one of our drill sites. Uh, you can see the flags of uh, some of the countries involved here and, uh, and our own university flag, which I made point of making sure was in all the photos. Uh, uh, but this is this is uh, in, in in the bottom of a uh, modern dry dry lake basin uh, in southern Ethiopia at one of the drill sites, and uh, so we moved over the course of uh, between 2012 and 2014 to a series of sites uh, up and down the Eastern Rift in Kenya and Ethiopia, collecting cores from. Um, areas that are close to some of the really important fossil hominin sites and covering the same time intervals. Next slide. OK, so our daily routine when we're out there drilling, uh, it's, I mean, for me, it's a lot of fun. 
but it's also a, a lot of hard work. Uh, we, uh, we have professional drillers, so we keep the scientists away from the heavy equipment. But uh, they get involved when the, when the drillers bring up the core and you hear uh, somebody yell out, core on deck, which means that's an old uh, mariner's term, actually, from when they were actually collecting them on the deck of a ship. But we still say that. So uh, that means the core has arrived, and then the scientists, these guys on the upper right, uh, get to work taking it out of the, uh, the coring and, and drilling device and then uh, carrying it back to the science tent where we uh, seal it up, we mark the cores, make sure they have arrows pointing the right way up, very important. Um, don't want to make, and believe me, that happens. Uh, <laughs> people make a mess of things. Uh, so it's really important that uh, the boss be present while things are going on and stuff gets done right. But the, the students that we've had working with us actually have been uh, terrific. And, um, and you can see uh, in the lower left-hand picture, uh, they come up in 10-foot segments. And this is in kind of a, a, a soft polybutyrate plastic liner, which you can see is kind of sagging. So we have to cut them into more manageable pieces about this size. And we do that over and over again. So the cores might be Ultimately, we're drilling hundreds of meters down into the ground. Uh, next slide. It's expensive to drill. Uh, it costs a lot of money to rent one of these rigs. Uh, it's not as expensive as hiring an oil rig, but it's still pretty expensive. And so uh, we have to be efficient, and we work 24-7. So uh, most of the time, I actually prefer being on the night crew because it's cooler uh, when you're working. Uh, although then you have to go and sleep in a hot tent. So I don't know. I'm not sure which one's better. But um, it, there's always activity going on. And uh, uh, a lot of the time, most of the time, you hope that things are going well. Next slide. Sometimes things don't go so well. The, the humidity gets in the way. <laughs> and uh, uh, many times, many of our drill sites are, are down on old dry lake and uh, they're not so dry uh, when it starts to rain. Turns into a big mud puddle. Uh, here on the upper right, you can see them kind of building a, a defense around the science tent. But uh, when conditions get like this, you, it pretty much shuts us down uh, because we, we have to uh, use water. We use a lot of water uh, when we're drilling, and we can't just use this muddy water. So. Um, the trucks actually can't even get into the drill rig, and we have to just uh, wait, wait it out until things dry out a little bit. And then sometimes we have really interesting uh, weather challenges, like uh, similar to the haboobs, the dust storms that we have here and in Phoenix. Uh, these would sometimes come rolling across, and I, I still don't understand why those guys were walking towards that thing. It was uh, kind of crazy, but um, yeah, we'd see these pretty regularly. Next slide. So uh, at the end of the day, we would come up with these gorgeous cores. And uh, to me, uh, as, a, uh, as a, a drilling guy, a core guy, uh, I see stuff like this and I get really excited. Uh, you can see in those upper two, uh, the, the layers are actually tilted. That's because the rocks were actually tilted that we were drilling through here uh, in some cases. But the, all those, uh, those thin layers are very similar to the ones that I showed you before when I was explaining why we like lake beds. Uh, they're made up of the, uh, of the skeletons. The, the sediments are made up of the skeletons of little single-celled algae. And we can tell from the types of algae that are there whether the lake was salty or fresh and, uh, and how it was changing over time. Uh, down at the bottom, uh, the very different kinds of environmental conditions recorded. Uh, the, the next to the lowest one is a core on its side uh, that has some gr stream gravels in it, so a period of time when the lake was completely gone. And the lowest one in there with those uh, cross-like, funny wedge-like structures that are kind of white, those are uh, burrows and, and soils, much like you'd find in Tucson in the uh, caliche if, in your yard, if you've ever gone in with a caliche iron and tried to bust through it when you're gardening. Uh, that's, that's what's going on there. So it's an ancient soil, and, and it, sometimes our, our lake beds uh, would dry out and they would turn into soil. So even when that happens, it gives us a lot of environmental clues. Next slide. Okay, so here's just a map of the eastern part of Africa. 
um, Ethiopia and Somalia up in the uh, northeast corner there, and Kenya down in the southwestern part of this map area. And it's a little bit busy diagram here, but what you're seeing here is the age on the bottom in millions of years. MA is millions of years. And um, those red bars indicate the time frame of each of those sites. The numbers indicate the depth below the ground that we were able to drill a core. So you can see in some places we got up to almost 300 meters uh, below the surface. Uh, usually we'd stop when we'd have all kinds of technical problems that would prevent us from getting uh, any further, or sometimes we'd stop when we ran out of money. That's actually, that was more common. Uh, so we had a certain amount budgeted for each of these locations. But they span, as you can see, in, uh, fairly long periods of time collectively. Our idea wasn't to uh, get complete coverage of the last four million years between all of them, but rather to look at specific intervals of time that we thought were really interesting in those locations. So next slide. So here's that uh, um, picture of our family tree again. Um, and uh, now I'm going to put up here, if, if we can uh, take the first slide, just showing you the, the time periods that our cores cover. So we have uh, several of them that cover uh, the last uh, six or 700,000 years. Another one that covers a period of time from about uh, 1.8 to 1.3 million years, and a couple that cover the period from about uh, at the beginning of the uh, glacial period uh, from about three and a half to about two and a half million years. And sorry, uh, go back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, what's interesting about these time intervals is that each of them is what we would call a critical interval. It's a time in human evolution, a time when something interesting is going on. The, the evolution of our own species, say, uh, 300,000 years ago, or the, evo the evolution of uh, a certain kind of technology like these big uh, Achillean stone hand axes. Uh, what was actually happening on the landscape when those events took place? So that was, uh, that was our motivation. And then to test those ideas, those hypotheses uh, about uh, the environmental controls. Um, next slide. So let me just show you uh, some of the locations and, and, and uh, what we're interested in. Some of the older ones uh, in the northern part of Ethiopia and in central Kenya span this period of time, the beginning of the uh, northern hemisphere ice ages, when uh, especially in the northern um, part of Ethiopia, we have just an amazing number of fossils that have come from this area, particularly of a species called Australopithecus afarensis, or the, colloquially called Lucy, which is the fossil, uh, very complete skeleton up in the upper right. And it's also the time period uh, where some of the oldest stone tools, these uh, Oldowan Lomequian stone tools that you see here in the lower middle panel, that big um, chopper there, uh, it's basically a rock that's had a couple of pieces uh, knocked off of it. So some of the earliest um, stone tool making technologies. Really interesting events going on, not just the evolution of the species, but also its extinction. What caused its demise, and, and was that related to climate uh, changes? Next slide. Uh, here's what the landscape looks like. It's pretty, it's pretty darn arid, much drier than Tucson. Um, and, uh, but it hasn't always been like this. We see evidence in the cores from things like the fossil pollen and the presence of big lakes that it, at times in the past, this was actually, uh, I wouldn't say lush, but uh, a much wetter environment with big, deep lakes. Um, and these are actually outcrops of the, of the lake beds that we were drilling through. Next slide. Here's a, a, a site I already showed you, uh, this photo from the uh, west side of Lake Turkana in northern Kenya. In the map in the center there, if, I don't know if you can see this from the back, there's an outline of the modern lake, kind of a narrow thing. And then that big green blob is the shape of the lake, as best we understand it, from the time period covered by the drill core here from about 1.8 to 1.4 million years ago. And we chose this site uh, because it is the time period when uh, this technology of making these Ashleyan hand axes first appeared. Uh, you can see them down on the. Uh, it's not a ghost. I think that guy looks like a ghost, but um, down in the uh, lower right. 
And really uh, importantly, the skeleton that is above that, uh, which is colloquially called Turconoboy, it's an early Homo um, ergaster, Homo erectus. Uh, it's one of the most complete uh, fossil skeletons of an early hominid known, from, if not the most complete, uh, from anywhere. And uh, again, about uh, 1.7, 1.8 million years old. We can, uh, within centimeters, tie in our drill site level in the in the core to where that guy was found in the outcrop. So it gives us a really good context for understanding what the conditions were that that thing faced. Next slide. And then uh, Lake Magadi in Kenya. I'll just I'm going to show you a little bit of data from here. Not too much, uh, but uh, this is a, a site that spans the last uh, million years. And uh, we're really excited about this because it's a time period that covers the origin of our own species, Homo sapiens, the, uh, the uh, development or evolution of uh, more recent types of stone tool technologies, what's called the Middle Stone Age, and the transition out of those big uh, hand axes, and, uh, and as well as the uh, appearance of a lot of the species of animals that uh, we associate with uh, nature documentaries, David Attenborough films of, of East Africa with the uh, uh, antelopes, the various kinds of gazelles and impalas. Uh, a lot of that fauna uh, evolved over that same period of time as, as this environments were changing in the area. So the drill core here, next slide, you can see it's on a dry lake bed there in the lower right. We, we go through this process of taking the cores back to the lab cutting them open, analyzing them, we, we, uh, we image them, uh, so to make those beautiful photos I told you about or showed you before. Uh, we cut samples out of them and, uh, and then we look at them under the microscope for all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of data. So there are many different teams of people working on them. Next slide. And I'll, I just want to show you uh, one data set uh, and that's, that's all the data I'm going to show you. <laughs> Uh, for, that covers this last 550 or 600,000 years. Uh, and the, the diagram that you're seeing on the left-hand side, uh, don't advance it yet, hold on. Um, uh, the diagram on the left-hand side is uh, showing the wiggles back and forth of climate as it is changing over that 600,000 year period from wetter to drier. Well, how do we know that? We know it because we uh, can collect and look at the little individual uh, grains of pollen. There's an example of one down there on the bottom. And look at things like, are there more trees on the landscape? Are there, is there more grass or uh, shrubs that would indicate uh, dry conditions? So by using those kinds of records, we can piece together how the uh, landscape has changed, not just the lake itself, but the, the watershed, the area around it, through these critical periods of time. So the uh, extinction and evolution of the modern fauna in East Africa about 400 to 500,000 years ago. Now we can go to the next one. Uh, the earliest modern Homo sapiens known just recently uh, dated, not in this part of Africa, but in Morocco to about 315,000 years ago. Uh, these dates change because over time we find older and, or for the, uh, the extinction of a species, we may find younger ones as well. Uh, but for the, moment, for the time being, this is the oldest one that we know of. Um, next slide. Okay, the evolution of the uh, Middle Stone Age technology, these tools that I've got up here uh, that um, uh, replaced the big stone hand axes, uh, again, around 300,000 years ago. Next slide. The earliest members of our, uh, our own species in East Africa around 200,000 years ago. Again, they may have been walking around here 100,000 years before that. We know they were in Morocco. It's very likely they were uh, in, uh, in East Africa as well. Next slide. Uh, the spread of our own species out of Africa somewhat less than 200,000 years ago, perhaps by, car by way of corridors through uh, the eastern part of Africa. So again, something that we're very interested in, not just the evolution of species, but the conditions that may have favored the dispersal of our own species around Africa, into Eurasia, and eventually all around the world. Next slide. 
And finally, the evolution about 60,000 years ago of, uh, of late Stone Age technology. Uh, these cave paintings are just a good example of this, but uh, I've got some uh, stone tools up here as well that you can take a look at. So all of this is going on in the context of a drying environment. So this is the kind of data that we're, uh, we're still very much in the uh, putting this together, testing the hypotheses that I laid out at the beginning. Is it more that trend towards uh, drier conditions, or is it more the wiggles back and forth uh, going from more to less variable conditions that are the key uh, variables of, of, uh, that are driving uh, human adaptation? We still, these are still unanswered questions. I don't have an answer for you tonight. It's the kind of thing that's motivating a lot of this work. Um, but we're still very much in the phase where we're analyzing these individual records and starting to compile them, compare them from one site to another, compare them with the records from the deep sea and the outcrops, and ultimately with the fossils. So um, next slide. So the next phase of all of this is, uh, next slide. We've got a lot of work to do on the course. We collected about two kilometers of these things. And uh, that's a lot of mud to, there's a lot of graduate students that are working away at individual samples, counting those pollen grains, measuring the isotopes, um, determining what the chemistry of these sediments are, looking at the little uh, microfossils in them. All of those things are uh, things that are underway uh, and we're starting to learn some really interesting stories like the one that I just showed you, but we're not, we're not there yet. Uh, the other thing that we do is that we work uh, with climate modelers to understand how uh, these changes that we see in these records, um, can we understand the dynamics behind those changes? So why is that? Not just Africa was drier, Africa was wetter, but why is it drier? And why is it wetter? Uh, so we have a big, uh, big collaboration at the U of A uh, between our group and, uh, and, and climate scientists, climate modelers, to try to understand, uh, make sense out of these records, what's happened in the past. Of course, tying it into the, the fossils and the stone tools is also critical. And uh, so there's also a lot of paleoanthropologists uh, part of our team. And they come in sort of the, the tail end of it. They, uh, although we put them to work at the drill sites, but uh, mostly they come back at the at the end when, when we start asking these, these fundamental questions about what is, what is the relationship between the environment and the appearance or disappearance of different species. Uh, so with the, ultimately we can evaluate these models that are linking human evolution to climate and environment and also hopefully to propose new ideas uh, as we get more evidence. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, have a video, and then I can take some questions. But um, I appreciate your interest. And if you, if you are interested in this more and learning more, uh, we have a, uh, a website. And we also are on Facebook. If you just type in HSPDP, you'll find us. Uh, and so thank you very much. And um, maybe we can uh, uh, show the video now. Thank you. This is, uh, this film is uh, one of the outreach uh, exercises that we've done as part of this project is to develop uh, initially a 13 minute 3D film, and sorry I didn't have enough glasses for all of you, um, but uh, um, you can uh, see the whole film in 2D on YouTube. Um, so this is just about a seven minute clip of it. We're working and are almost finished with a, a, a 30 minute version of it which is going to hopefully, our, our filmmakers are going to uh, pedal this to PBS. And so hopefully you'll see it uh, on the screen, on the small screen in not too distant future. So go ahead. It was in East Africa that our human ancestors evolved for some six million years. Like other living beings, they adapted to changes in their environment. But what exactly were those changes? And how did they influence human evolution? New research is revealing details of how a changing climate 
may have pushed our early ancestors to become the humans we are today. This site was reported to us by the owner of this farm. The owner reported it to the National Museums of Kenya. That's how we got to come and uh, check it up, and we found lots of bones lying on this uh, ground. Slowly and methodically, anthropologists are piecing together a timeline of our human ancestors. By six million years ago, they had gone from living in the trees to both climbing trees and walking on two feet in search of food. But by two million years ago, they were primarily living on the ground. As we come through our evolution, we abandon the life in trees. And what that means is if we abandon life in the trees, we have to be good walkers on two legs on one on the ground. Because when you walk on the ground, there are lots of dangers. For decades, scientists have worked with the idea that our ancestors left the trees because of a drying of the environment. In general, East Africa has become progressively drier over the past five million years. And the landscape has changed from one that was predominantly covered by forest to one predominantly covered by grassland and sparse forest vegetation. But was it simply a long drying trend or was there something more complicated about the climate that favored our ancestors' key traits, such as upright walking and increased brain size? To answer these questions, geologists have been studying rocky outcrops. But the rocks are typically weathered and eroded. So the view of the ancient past has been obscured. So do you think that you should be able to identify vertisols? That is about to change. An unusual collaboration of anthropologists and geologists working in Kenya and Ethiopia has begun to refine the story of the ancestral human environment. The scientists are using drilling technology to collect sediments from ancient lake beds in areas where important human fossils have been found. By looking at the same interval of time when these human fossils are found, we can get a very detailed record of environmental change, particularly through a period that we already suspect from a wide variety of evidence is a period of major climatic change towards drier conditions. What we want to do is to get continuous and undisturbed lake sediment sequences, which will not have any gaps and uh, which we can study at fairly high resolution. 15 meters. Keep up that rate, we'll be done in a week. That didn't happen. What they're trying to find out is if climate changes and related shifts in the environment coincided with key milestones in human evolution. One place that may hold critical answers is Hadar in the Afar region of Ethiopia. It was in this arid landscape that the skeleton Lucy was discovered in 1974. Lucy lived 3.2 million years ago. A simple monument marks the site of the discovery. What Lucy represents is a time, a moment in our evolutionary history that really captures that mix of ape and human in one skeleton. Lucy has longer arms and a small brain like a chimpanzee and more human-like body structure when you look at their hip bones and the legs and the foot. To find out more specifics about Lucy's environment, scientists are drilling into an ancient dry lake bed close to where her fossilized bones were found. So the reason we're drilling in this general area is actually to capture sort of what the climate and environment was like during Lucy's time. 
And the drilling is great because the lakes themselves, they represent the, the watershed or the basin as a whole, whereas these fossil sites represent just one spot on the ground. So I found a couple of crocodiles. In both Ethiopia and Kenya, the fossil sites and drill sites are located in the East African Rift Valley. This valley was formed by the movement of the Earth's enormous tectonic plates, which have been splitting the entire continent apart in East Africa for many millions of years and forming a huge trough. It's an ideal location for fossils to accumulate. It's an area where for millions of years, going back to some of our earliest ancestors and the split between humans, say, and the great apes, we have a place where sediments and fossils can be found and are there specifically because of this rifting process. The Rift Valley's ancient lakes are of special interest to anthropologists. One of them is Lake Turkana in northern Kenya. Here, 1.6 million years ago, lived a young male that scientists call Turkana boy. His fossilized skeleton was discovered in 1984. Yeah, hello, how are you? Yeah, how are you? Where was the first bit Kamoya found? It was picked around here, almost at the end, the top there. This is a fish, fish, yeah. Fish. The excavation took us quite a long time because the fossils were scattered all over. And I remember actually we were like here for about four years. Certainly one of the most striking things about the Tucana boy discovery was that when that skeleton was reconstructed into something like a 70% complete uh, skeleton, it, it looked like us. It really caught everyone's eyes as, you know, this was the size, shape, the stature, the build of modern humans and nothing like any of the earlier forms or the close relatives that existed at that time. Turkana boy was a member of an early human species, Homo erectus. Homo erectus looked pretty much like us with regard to body proportions. Long legs, uh, probably an endurance walker, being able to uh, undertake the life of a hunter-gatherer and probably due to its strength, was able to knock off large flakes, which is the beginning of making stone hand axes. The drill site chosen to examine Turkana boy's environment is close to where his bones were found. In the drill core sediments, scientists are delighted to find key items that will shed light on the environment in the time of Turkana boy. One of them is fossilized pollen. When you look at the pollen, it's a very good way of putting together a pretty detailed picture of what the vegetation was like at a certain time. Um, a lot of it is based on the kinds of vegetation communities that you see today, but you also see vegetation communities that were a lot different as well. The question is, how did the vegetation in this region change with the drying climate? And how did our human ancestors adapt and evolve? One of the theories in evolution in general is that you have changes in the environment driving changes in organisms through natural... Good place to stop. Um, so uh, there's, that's about halfway through it, but, but uh, as I said, you can, you can see the whole film on uh, YouTube. And uh, so I'm happy to answer questions. Is this all? okay? Great. Uh, so we'll just remind folks. We'll when you raise your hand, we'll do our best to work the room and ask your question. Just hand the microphone back. Stan, can you get that? Why did <clears throat> why did it start in Africa? Why did we start in Africa? I mean, why Africa versus South America? Or it's a great question because uh, there. I mean, there were primates in. Uh, uh, in, in the New World, there are primates in the New World, uh, and, in, and in Asia. Um, why Africa? I, I don't know. I, I really don't have an answer for that. We, I mean, we, um, we are one of 
a number of different lineages of modern primates. And uh, while we were, uh, while the hominins were evolving and our close relatives, the great apes were evolving in, um, in Africa, uh, simultaneously there were other large apes that were uh, evolving in different lineages in, uh, in Asia. Uh, in South Asia, uh, we find uh, hominoids, things that are a little more distantly related uh, to us, and, and uh, lineages of uh, such as the orangutans and gibbons uh, that are kind of distantly related, a little more so than the African great apes. But um, as to why that particular lineage took off into becoming uh, a group, it, it is important to, to point out that the origin of uh, what defines us as a hominin is our walking on, on two legs as a, a bipedal creature. But uh, if you come up and look at these skulls here later on, you'll see that, and as the film indicated, uh, a lot of the early hominins, um, Australopithecus afarensis, Ardipithecus, these things uh, had brain sizes that were uh, similar to a chimps. They were not uh, large brains. So the, the acquisition of what we think of as a humanity is not something that happened at one time. We did uh, move out of Africa around two million years ago. We find fossils in Eurasia, but what it was that caused the, uh, this lineage to appear in Africa, it's, I, I, there isn't really a, a, a simple, straightforward answer to that, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, are there any other studies in other parts of like West Africa, even though you're minus homonyms, uh, looking at the lake bed sediments and being able to correlate anything like Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Um, and one of the things I'm really proud of with our project is that it has spurred other groups to uh, take this same kind of approach uh, in, in other places. We never saw this as being or the only place to do this. Uh, we didn't have an infinite amount of money, so we had to pick and choose. Uh, East Africa was very attractive because there are there is a very thick and continuous pile of sediments there. But there is a group that is, uh, for example, uh, uh, doing ge geology around uh, what is arguably some of the very earliest uh, fossil hominins known um, from uh, uh, w from the uh, Lake Chad Basin over in West Africa, and uh, uh, in, that, in that site they've found. Uh, fossils that are about six million years old, so um, uh, six to seven million. There, there are a few scraps in East Africa that are that old, but they're much older than any of these things. And there's a group that is uh, proposing to uh, collect drill cores from uh, the dry lake beds of Lake Chad. Uh, unfortunately, right now, because of Boko Haram and, and the violence in that area, it's not. It's kind of on hold. But uh, it is something that people are talking about. In general. In West Africa, there just aren't the thick deposits uh, where you could uh, do this kind of approach of, of old lakes uh, that have persisted for long periods of time. In South Africa, we have an excellent fossil record uh, of hominins uh, that spans the last couple of million years, but it's in a very different context. There it's in caves, and so uh, we don't have long, thick piles of sediment accumulating that can be directly tied into the um, into the fossils. Uh, so for the other parts of Africa to get these environmental records, we have to rely on uh, going to those marine cores, those deep sea uh, cores off the, uh, off the continental coast. Hi, even though I know you've been talking about Africa, um, when I grew up, you know, they always told us that the first Americans came over the land bridge, et cetera, et cetera. At this point, has there ever been any um, other evidence of any other humans that had been in, in the New World before that? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. So uh, very late in his life, uh, Louis Leakey uh, in one of, I mean, they, they didn't call him Lucky Leakey for, for nothing. He was uh, a very lucky, he, and, oh, he was lucky to be married to Mary Leakey, first of all, because she did actually most of the discoveries. But, um, but uh, Louis, uh, 
got enamored with this idea uh, that was being promoted by some uh, archaeologists in uh, Southern California at a place called Calico Hills uh, that briefly became famous in the 1970s uh, where they found what they interpreted as um, stone tools comparable to this chopper and they were finding rocks that looked like this. There were no bones associated with it, but they found a bunch of things that uh, Lewis uh, put his stamp of approval on it. And uh, it was unfortunate because it turned out it was eventually discovered that it was, it was just a, a stream gravels. And in a stream, it's not impossible to form something like this. A rock comes along in a storm and smashes onto another rock, and then you have something that looks like this. And it's such a, it's a, such a, a primitive tool with just three flakes broken off of it that uh, you know you you could wonder reasonably enough. Well, how do you know this is made by a, a person or, or an, a hominid? And uh, in that case, it was pretty clear they were associated with stream deposits. In East Africa, we can find these things um, in places that where big rocks like this, there's no way to carry them in there. Uh, and, and there's uh, associations of them with uh, bones and, and other things that tell us it's an actual tool. So uh, in North America, uh, and South America, we, we presently don't know of any, um, conf I would say, confirmed uh, fossil archaeological sites more than about 18,000 years. Uh, and, and even when you get that old, it, it starts to become questionable. Certainly by 15,000 years ago, there's pretty good evidence, in, even in southern South America. But uh, nothing... Uh, remotely this old. All the evidence uh, points to modern humans dispersing into Eurasia from Africa around 200,000, maybe a little bit before that years ago. But when they spread out, they weren't alone. There were other species like Neanderthals, uh, archaic Homo sapiens, uh, that had been tromping around in Eurasia for a long period of time. Why they didn't disperse uh, from uh, Eurasia into the, into the New World until that period of time, hard to say. They, they didn't make it. Animals, mammals have some biological range or geographical range, and for whatever reason, uh, they, they didn't spread into that area until that period of time. Need just a second to get over there. Thank you. One of your early graphs was about uh, the temperature of the world mm -hmm. through the oceans, and you said that it is quite a bit colder now than our early records would indicate. Yeah. So How let does me. that square to <laughs> global to climate, warming? Yeah. So let me let me elaborate on that. Okay. Because uh, that's a that's a very important point. So um, the this this long term trend over the last couple of million years is one of um, during the during the Pliocene period of time, the Earth was relatively warm. Uh, it was maybe comparable to the kind of temperatures that we're seeing now, and and certainly the temperatures we will see in the near future. Uh, and then during that period, starting about three million years ago. Uh, glaciers started to form. They would wax and wane in the northern hemisphere. We had ice sheets in, in Antarctica, but um, but in, in in the northern polar regions in Greenland and, and uh, the northern parts of North America and Eurasia, uh, ice started to form, and it would go through cycles where it would come and go. Okay, so uh, about uh, twenty thousand years ago, the last one of these really extreme ice ages ended. And uh, we've been coming out of that uh, during the period of time, especially starting about 10,000 years ago, the climate warmed substantially. And, and over the last 10,000 years, until, um, until 100 years ago, 200 years ago, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, we can tell from uh, carbon dioxide records and from the, the measurements of temperatures 
that uh, conditions during this past 10,000 years compared to those big swings uh, were, let's say, relatively stable. And they've, temperatures have been shooting up in the last, um, since the Industrial Revolution, particularly in the 20th century, uh, to levels now where the, uh, the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is comparable to some of the highest levels that we'd see back in the early parts of the record. So we, uh, the ice ages that uh, existed previously are a record or a consequence of these fluctuations, these climate fluctuations that occurred uh, as a result of uh, events related to the way the Earth interacts with the sun. Um, but the last 100 years, uh, the levels of carbon dioxide that we see in our atmosphere today are now getting way beyond what we see over the, uh, uh, over the record uh, prior to that. So big fluctuations on, on long time scales. Um, the point I made earlier, I think, is, is really important here to, to, um, to think about. You know, that uh, as environmental conditions, climate conditions change on our planet, uh, Hanans, uh, we're the last ones standing, okay? And uh, a lot of these extinctions may themselves have been, uh, the extinctions of these earlier species may have been related to uh, rapid environmental change conditions, particularly climate con change conditions. Uh, but what we're seeing now, uh, dwarfs, the rates of change dwarfs what we see in the past during these periods of time. So it's, it's a much shorter interval of time, a couple hundred years since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And during that period of time, we've seen uh, changes in uh, greenhouse gases in our atmosphere that are comparable to one of these entire uh, fluctuation cycles of the past that was going on on timescales of tens or hundreds of thousands of years. So. Um, my question is kind of a, I guess, multi-level, but changes in flora and fauna uh, due to climate change, could that have caused changes in our, uh, let's say, diets and caused then, in effect, changes in us and caused extinctions in others? and. Absolutely. In fact, um, if you can come up afterwards and take a look at some of these guys, uh, w the big lineage break that we see in the hominins uh, about uh, two and a half million years ago uh, between our own genus Homo. Um, I'll just pick these up. This is an archaic, uh, an early Homo. Homo Homo erectus, uh, the Turkana boy. In fact, this is the skull. It's a cast of it. Um, this one here, you see this great big ridge here on the skull. And uh, if you look at the teeth particularly, you'll see these enormous molars. Okay, This is uh, what's called a robust Australopithecine, Australopithecus boisei. And uh, probably these guys were chewing really tough plant matter. Uh, we're not even sure if these guys were stone tool makers, but we do know that they, uh, the differentiation of these two groups, uh, us versus them, they're all extinct, we're still around. Uh, these guys were uh, clearly uh, using uh, technology to uh, kill animals. Uh, that's, that's pretty clear to, uh, to forage with. Uh, to make these stone hand axes that are uh, kind of hallmarks of the time period when this guy was around. Um, whether these guys could, as I said, whether these guys could uh, had the ability to make and uh, use stone tools is still uh, debatable, but it's pretty clear from their dentition and the, the shape of their skull with this enormous, tough, uh, they, these things were, um, when they were originally discovered, uh, they thought, well, man, they, these things must have been grinding uh, some kind of really, really tough plant matter. Um, the evolution of the uh, use of fire may have uh, played a big role in this also. Uh, 
and, and it's debated among anthropologists when exactly that happens, but there is evidence for it, um, albeit weak, back to two million, pretty strong, back to one million. If you cook meat, you can make it a lot more tender, obviously, uh, and it requires a, a lot less effort. Um, so a lot of the evolution of different technologies went into you know, developing better ways to uh, process food uh, stone tools in one group versus just this uh, uh, these really tough jaws with these giant masticatory uh, apparatus and muscles on their face in this other group. So absolutely, uh, the diet is reflected in the morphology and in the evolution of different groups. One thing I find fascinating is that the Native Americans have no facial hair. You, you look at paintings of Indians, excuse me, Native Americans, <clears throat> and they all look like they have clean, clean shaven. Is there any reason for, for that physical characteristic to develop? <laughs> I, I'm not enough of a physical anthropologist to really uh, answer that or comment on it. I mean, we see uh, tremendous uh, variation in human uh, physiognomy, shape, size today, and, you know, some of the some of these are clearly adaptations to environmental or climate conditions. People that live at high altitudes, for example, their selection for, uh, uh, certain, uh, for certain genes that allow you to respire and have a more efficient metabolism under lower oxygen conditions at higher elevations. And uh, um, the, uh, the diets in, in various early, like the Neanderthals, had different body shapes than than we do, uh, but uh, the, the specific question, I, I, I don't know. Um, I realize it's about eight o'clock and I know you've offered to have some people come down and take a look at the samples that you've brought and ask some Absolutely. questions one-on-one. -on -one. I have one more question for you. Would you mind telling the crowd how you got interested in this, how it became your career and passion? Well, I, when I was a kid, I, I loved fossils. My father would take me collecting fossils, but I grew up in New Jersey and, uh, I didn't know much about geology, and so it never even occurred to me that you could do that for a job. Uh, I went to college, I took a geology class, and thought, oh, this is great, I love this. Uh, I'm gonna become a paleontologist. And uh, I started my career um, uh, at Davis, uh, studying uh, marine fossils, trilobites, things like that. Um, but I wasn't really, I don't know, I wasn't really motivated, and, uh, um, various reasons, the things that uh, paleontologists sort of traditionally did uh, just didn't, didn't do it for me. And then I heard about uh, a professor at uh, UC Santa Cruz uh, who was uh, starting an expedition to East Africa to look at um, these ancient lake beds where the, some of these Turconoboid-like fossils were being found in northern Kenya. And so I cold called them and I said, hey, you don't know me, but would you take me on as your graduate student? And I kept calling them and finally convinced them. So here I am 40 years later. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. We hope to see you at the next Science Cafe here at Saddlebrook. It'll be our final one for this series. It's going to be March 22nd. Again, that's a Thursday. Don't forget to fill out the evaluations and please come up front to see what Dr. Cohen has brought. <laughs>